To start our symposium, we will hear from one of the world's most influential scientific minds and a leader in the food as medicine movement. Dr. Darius Mozafarian is a cardiologist, dean, and Jean Mayer professor at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy, and professor of medicine at Tufts Medical School. As one of the top nutrition institutions in the world, the Friedman School's mission is to produce trusted science, future leaders, and real world impact. Dr. Mozafarian has authored more than 400 scientific publications on dietary priorities for obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases, and on evidence-based policy approaches to reduce these burdens in the U.S. and globally. He has served in numerous advisory roles, including for the U.S. and Canadian governments, American Heart Association, World Health Organization, and United Nations. His work has been featured in a wide array of media outlets, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and National Public Radio. In 2016, Thomson Reuters named him as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. Before being appointed as Dean at Tufts in 2014, Dr. Mozafarian was at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health and clinically active in cardiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Please welcome Dr. Mozafarian. I'll discuss uh, you know, why that's such an honor for me in a minute, but my talk is going to be about reimagining U.S. food and nutrition policy. I think we have a special moment in time in our country uh, around food and nutrition. I'm going to try to show that to you and why this is a special time to really reimagine how we address food and nutrition. And so, um, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm really, truly honored to be here to be speaking at the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement. Um, the the mission to inform citizens, inspire creative cooperation, and catalyze change on issues of social justice, fairness, and opportunity. That very simple uh, sentence captures Senator Tom Harkin's career and approach to life uh, still today. Uh, and I've been just incredibly honored to be able to work with him uh, over the last year and a half on food and nutrition issues and have just been so impressed with um, uh, his, his intellect, his vision, his ability to to uh, you know, decipher complex issues and get right to the heart of what needs to be done now and why. And, and as I mentioned uh, you know, earlier in, in looking for photos that I thought typified his approach to, to life and to work, I love this central photo here with uh, Senator Harkin you know, down on the ground, you know, working with, with someone, uh, to, to, to a student in this case, uh, uh, and, and interacting with them. I think that just really typifies how he, he rolls up his sleeves and you know, really works to, ha to help uh, our country and the, and the people in it. And so I wanna start um, back with, um, you know, I said to re reimagine food policy, I wanna start back in 1969 at a conference that really um, laid out a lot of our modern food and nutrition policy. In 1969, um, Dr. Jean Mayer, who was a scientist uh, who went on to found the Friedman School that I now lead at Tufts University, um, helped organize the first and still only White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health. This was opened by and supported by President Nixon. Uh, it had congressional support, bipartisan support, including from Senators George McGovern and Bob Dole in particular. And this was a conference that was organized around hunger because in the 60s, earlier, uh, it was recognized widely in the country for the first time that there was really tremendous hunger in, in our country, a true caloric hunger where you had kids with, you know, distended bellies and emaciated arms, things that people didn't think existed in the United States. And so due to that, uh, uh, Dr. Jean Mayer was able to talk to President Nixon, convince him that this conference was needed. And this was not just getting together and, and chatting. This was a very organized process. They had uh, over a year of, of working groups um, working on policy recommendations to address uh, hunger and nutrition in the United States. And so by the time they got to the conference, um, they had uh, you know, really well laid out and well thought out policies. And, and so 1800 recommendations were uh, given to Congress and to the White House based on this conference, ad addressing nutrition guidelines and education and surveillance, food distribution, and in particular recommendations to address hunger in vulnerable groups. And two years after the conference, 1,650 of the 1,800 recommendations were actually implemented in some form. And it really led to our modern food and nutrition programming. It led to standardization and expansion of food stamps, now SNAP, expansion and standardization of school lunch. It led to creation of school breakfast, creation of WIC, which now feeds half of all babies born in the United States, 
uh, and creation of nutrition facts and other consumer labeling. Now, these programs are all incredibly important. They're incredibly valuable. They need to be strengthened, but they're not enough to meet the modern food and nutrition problems we have today. And so we've been, I think, riding on the coattails of this 1969 conference, riding on the coattails of these programs created over 50 years ago. And it's time to step back, look at our food and nutrition system and, and reimagine new solutions. So I think it's fair to say that we actually are facing a food and nutrition crisis. This is the top issue on the planet for health and well-being. It, it exceeds any other cause of poor health. It's a major issue for hunger and disparities. Um, it's driving up healthcare costs and, and reducing access um, uh, into to unforeseen, un, unforeseeable uh, levels. Uh, uh, it's straining government budgets uh, because of these rising healthcare costs, as I'll show you, for, for chronic diseases. And it's also straining private businesses and economic growth. Uh, many private businesses pay for their health insurance for, for their employees, and so that it's really straining a business. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this a lot today, but this is important to recognize that food and nutrition is also the single biggest issue for sustainability and climate change. And so when we have a new uh, administration that has made climate a top priority, they have to address food. 25% of all uh, climate change uh, uh, emissions, uh, the majority of, of pollution in the oceans, 70% of the, the world's water use, 80% uh, of all deforestation on the planet and 90% of tropical deforestation are all due to agriculture. And so if you put all that together, climate, uh, the oceans and our, and our waterways, the use of fresh water, uh, uh, deforestation, land use, this is the single biggest issue for sustainability on, on the planet. And this is also an issue for national security, as, I, as I'm going to discuss. Uh, and the reason I put all these things together is if we just talk about health and we just talk about hunger and we just talk about disparities, we may only be reaching, you know, a, a minority of our country who are, uh, you know, care about these issues which are traditionally viewed as progressive issues. And folks that, that you know, have other political views or other persuasions may not be convinced by conversations about health and hunger and disparities. But if we start to bring in the healthcare spending uh, on diet related diseases, if we start to talk about strained government budgets, if we start to talk about uh, jobs and economic growth and, and uh, American competitiveness on the international uh, business marketplace, if we start talking about sustainability and climate, and if we bring in the Department of Defense and national security, we start to see that food and nutrition touches every aspect of our lives, every aspect of our, of our government. And this is not a blue you know, state or red state issue. This is not a progressive or a conservative issue. This is an issue that is nonpartisan and needs to be uh, addressed. And I'll just show you a few examples of some of this. This is a, a research paper from a couple of years ago showing deaths in one year in the United States. The hundreds of thousands of deaths are here on the on this axis. And this shows us the different causes of these deaths, the, the estimated direct causes of these deaths. The colors are different types of deaths, and blue is mostly chronic diseases, uh, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, other, other chronic diseases. And you can see in the United States today, the top cause of death in the United States is, is poor diet, exceeding tobacco and uh, alcohol use and air pollution and occupational risks and every other major cause of mortality. So if you care about health, we have to address food as our top priority. Um, and we are so sick from, from poor nutrition that it's almost impossible to wrap our minds around. Way more American uh, uh, are, are sick today than are actually healthy. Think about that. Being healthy um, is actually the exception in our country today. Half of all adults in the United States have diabetes or prediabetes. That is not normal. Half of all adults have diabetes or prediabetes. More than half have some form of cardiovascular disease. Three and four are overweight or obese. And if you put those things together and you add in you know, blood cholesterol levels, only 12% of adults are metabolically healthy. One in eight, seven in eight adults today are metabolically unhealthy. And mostly this is from poor nutrition. The economic costs of this again are so large and has happened slowly over, over 50 years that we, we you know, have, have kind of failed to recognize the gravity of the situation. Healthcare costs in 50 years have skyrocketed from 5% of the federal budget to 28% of their federal budget, from 5% of the average state budget to 29% of state budgets. And we wonder why there's so much partisan ar argument and bickering over budgets. Healthcare is squeezing out every other priority. And for US businesses, even after adjusting for inflation, in 50 years, 
healthcare spending has risen from about $80 billion to $1.2 trillion. And this is now more than $11,000 per year spent on healthcare per man, woman, and child in the United States. Totally unsustainable. The average family of four, $44,000 is being spent on healthcare. That's more than some family incomes, and it's certainly more than families spend on housing or food uh, or many other uh, essential needs. And there's huge disparities. And I think in a time of, of recognition of structural racism, the Black Lives Matter movement, of, of the incredible importance of increasing equity in this country, we have to talk about food also as fundamental to inequity and fundamental to achieving better equity. And so what this graph shows is the percentage of, of American adults who have a poor, nutritionally poor diet um, from 2003 to 2012. And we've done updated analysis that looks very similar. And the different colors are by family income. And so red is uh, the lowest family income and green is the highest family income here by the family income to poverty level. And what you can see that uh, in 2012, and again, it hasn't changed very much, 60% of adults uh, with a low income had a poor nutritional quality diet versus only 35% with high income. And so there's two take home messages here. First, there's huge disparities in diet quality by income, by education, by race in our country. But secondly, even for the highest uh, income Americans, over one third have a poor quality diet. And so nutrition security is, is plaguing all levels of society in our country. And if you look at children, this is a similar graph for children. This is the percentage with poor nutritional quality by race, by income, family income, and by household food security. You see that there's high rates of, of poor nutritional quality across all uh, groups, over 40% for all, all groups, but there's also inequities. And so black, black children, uh, children with lower family incomes and, and households with lower food security have, have worse nutritional quality diets. Um, and this leads to health outcomes, poor health outcomes. What this chart shows you is, is the hazard ratio or the risk of dying uh, from all causes, from cardiovascular disease and diabetes combined, from just cardiovascular diseases and from some other specific conditions, including diabetes. The, the, the risk is compared to a risk of one, which is, which is the comparator of people who have incomes that are uh, exceed the threshold for being eligible for SNAP. And in comparison, we show you the risk for dying for people who are eligible for SNAP uh, according to their income, but are not on SNAP, probably because they have other social supports and other reasons why they don't need to be on SNAP. And then people who are low income uh, and are on SNAP in the red dots. And what you can see is that this is adjusted for an age, race, education, many other risk factors. Uh, people who are on SNAP have a twofold higher risk of dying, double the risk of dying than people who are not eligible for SNAP. And most of this is due to cardiovascular diseases, diet related diseases, in particular diabetes, a threefold higher risk of dying from diabetes. Um, now, rising healthcare costs, uh, in addition to causing you know, uh, uh, de devastation for our government budgets and for private businesses, they're also leading to wage inequality. This is a paper that, that has not yet been published that we're uh, uh, pre preparing right now, showing how rising healthcare costs have been a major contributor to wage stagnation over the last 35 years and wage inequities over the last 35 years. We've talked a lot about, uh, in our country, we've talked a lot about wage stagnation, how the bottom 50%, 70% of our country, real wages have not gone up and in some cases have gone down over the last 20 or 30 years. And a lot of the explanation around that has been around tax cuts, tax cuts for the wealthy, other things. But one major explanation that is not talked about as much is rising healthcare costs. And 80 to 80 to 85 percent of rising healthcare costs are due to diet-related chronic diseases. So what this graph shows you is the rising uh, healthcare premiums for families who have employer-based healthcare premiums. By, by categories, different categories of income in the United States, the 20th percentile of income to the up to the 95th percentile of income in the United States. And you can see in 1984 that, you know, for higher income individuals, healthcare premiums represented around 3% of their, of their compensation. And for lower income individuals at the 20th percentile of income, uh, healthcare premiums represented about 15% of their total compensation. Well, what's happened over time is healthcare premiums have gone up 
you know, yes, it's squeezing the the uh, in, income of highest income uh, Americans a little bit. It's gone from about three percent up to about six percent, so it's doubled. That's a pretty big difference. But look what's happened to lower uh, income income uh, Americans. It, healthcare spending has has as a proportion of their co total compensation has gone from fifteen percent to over thirty five percent of the total compensation that an employer receives. And so in real dollars, uh, in, in 2020 dollars, this represents $184,000 in lost income over this 35 years for the median uh, US family income. So really devastating effects on wage uh, inequities. Now, the public is also confused. This is another challenge, huge challenge. The public has no idea, uh, or not no idea, but mixed ideas, confused ideas about what to eat, what to do. Should I eat breakfast, skip breakfast? Is intermittent fasting good? Should I take supplements? Is coconut oil a superfood? Is coffee good for me or bad for me? Is meat good for me or bad for me? Should I be on a keto diet, a paleo diet? I mean, I could go on and on about all the confusion. And this is not, this is not good. This is not good for our country when food and nutrition is the top cause of poor health, when food and nutrition is causing so much inequity, when food and nutrition is causing uh, a rising healthcare spending, wage inequalities, a, a, you know, rising costs for American businesses, having public confusion on top, top of this is, is very challenging. And as I mentioned, you know, if, as if that weren't enough, this is imperiling national security. And so there's a wonderful organization, Mission Readiness. Uh, uh, if you don't know Mission Readiness, I encourage you to go to their website and, and, and look them up. Mission Readiness is over 750 retired generals and admirals from our armed forces who have all served and have, have been leaders in the military. They have come out with several reports. This is their most recent, uh, showing very clearly that child malnutrition is a grave threat to America's national security. Um, over 70% uh, uh, of young Americans who are otherwise qualified cannot serve in the military today. And the number one medical reason is obesity. And so uh, Mission Readiness has, has come out with excellent reports saying this is a major, major issue to improve child nutrition and overall nutrition uh, in, our, in our country. And COVID-19, which is of course on all of our minds, has I think made this you know, very clear. So when I say we face a special moment in time, if you put together everything that I just showed you, and on top of that, you add COVID-19, this is why we face a special moment in time. COVID-19 has shown us that our food system is broken, it's fragmented, there's huge inequities, and that diet-related diseases are making COVID-19 much, much worse than it would have been otherwise uh, uh, if we didn't have a sick, uh, metabolically unwell population. So I think of COVID-19 as a fast pandemic on top of a slow pandemic. The fast pandemic is the virus itself hitting our country over the last year. The slow pandemic is the 30 year uh, 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 epidemic of obesity and type, type two diabetes. Over just 30 years, we've had skyrocketing rates of obesity and type two diabetes. And these two pandemics are interlinked. If we didn't have the slow pandemic of obesity and type two diabetes, COVID-19 would have been much, much less severe, much, much less problematic in our country. And we see that in the experience of other countries like India and Japan and Vietnam uh, and, and South Korea and, and others. Diet-related diseases like diabetes, obesity, and hypertension in particular, those are the three top risks for poor outcomes with COVID-19. And what links those things together is vascular dysfunction, dysfunction of the, a person's blood vessels and systemic inflammation. And so this cartoon here, I won't go into the details, but this cartoon here shows all the ways that COVID-19 is actually a virus that attacks the blood vessels, not just the lungs, but attacks the blood vessels uh, of the body and, and uh, all the pathways. And what this shows you is an actual scanning micrograph of, of lungs, uh, of capillaries, blood vessels from, from the lungs of a healthy patient. These are normal capillaries, and these are destroyed and damaged capillaries from the lungs of a, of a patient with COVID-19. So COVID-19 is not just a, a virus that affects the lungs, but a virus that attacks the blood vessels and causes inflammation. And diabetes, obesity, and hypertension are all diseases that start with and are fundamentally diseases where you have abnormal function of your blood vessels and systemic inflammation. And so COVID-19 in our country has been like pouring gasoline on a smoldering fire. We've had the smoldering fire of diabetes and obesity, and now we've poured the gasoline of COVID-19 on top of it. And this is a paper we published just a week ago, estimating how much of the COVID hospitalizations that our country has seen 
could have been prevented if we had a metabolically healthy population. This is a modeling study, a simulation study. And what we found is that 30% of all the hospitalizations could have been prevented if we didn't have obesity because people would have gotten the virus but not gotten ill enough to need to be hospitalized. 20% would have been prevented if we didn't have the rates of diabetes we do have now, 26% from hypertension and, and about 12% from heart failure. And if you put all these together and, and they're not additive because a, a person can have more than one of these, so they're less than additive. If you put all these together, we estimated that 63% of, of COVID hospitalizations could have been prevented if we had a metabolically healthy population. That's over 600,000 hospitalizations and all of the associated deaths uh, in, in 2020. This is not, these are not small numbers. So how do we fix this? So, you know, this is a talk about policy. How do we fix this? You know, first we have to focus on healthy foods. We've focused in our country for 20 or 30 years uh, and even 50 years before that on nutrients. First, getting enough vitamins to people, getting vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin A to people in sort of the, the mid last century. And in the last 30 years, there's been a lot of focus on reducing the bad. Let's, let's have lower fat, lower saturated fat, lower sugar, and so on. What we haven't focused enough on is foods. There's foods that are really good for us, protective foods. We need to increase their intake. And so I think of the dietary priorities that our policies need to address that reimagined US food policy needs to address in three tiers. First, there are protective foods. There are foods that are really good for us. And these are the ones that have been most underemphasized in our policies over the last, let's say 100, 100, 150 years. We really have to focus on increasing protective foods for all Americans, fruits, nuts, fish, vegetables, plant oils, whole grains, beans, yogurt. These foods have in common, they're fiber rich, they're less processed, they have thousands and thousands of phytonutrients and flavanols and, and other bioactives that are good for our bodies. They benefit our microbiome. And in addition, fish has omega-3s, plant oils have healthy fats, yogurt has probiotics. These are foods that are protective and we should be increasing uh, to, to everyone uh, uh, in, in our communities. Then there are foods that are kind of more neutral that we should eat in moderation. Cheese, poultry, milk, eggs, butter, unprocessed red meats. Uh, cheese is a little bit better than neutral in this graph because cheese as a fermented food may actually lower risk of diabetes, uh, not defined yet, but cheese actually may be a little bit good for you. And unprocessed meats a little bit lower than neutral, a little bit bad for us because they are linked to risk of diabetes in particular. Uh, and so should be really eaten maybe no more than one or two servings per week at most. And then lastly, there's harmful foods, foods that we should avoid. And the top of this list is refined grains, starches and sugars, which are about 40% of calories in the US food supply. And notice, I didn't just say sugars. There's a lot of focus on sugar today, but there's not as much focus on starch. And starch, like white bread, you know, white rice, breakfast cereals, energy bars, on and on, that's really kind of think of it like the hidden sugar in the US food supply. And then also processed meats and other highly processed and packaged foods. Now note, I'm not saying to eat all foods in moderation. I do not think that is the right scientific approach or the right policy approach. We should not be saying Americans should eat all foods in moderation. That's an industry message that everything is okay. It's absolutely not true. There are good foods that we should be emphasizing, neutral foods that we should be eating in moderation and harmful foods that we should be uh, avoiding. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't know, and we need a lot more science, and I'm gonna talk about that. We need a lot more science to understand how foods affect our gut microbiome, how we can personalize nutrition, what are the health impacts of all of the thousands of phenolics and flavanols that are in foods, the impact of, of food processing, additives, the timing of meals, does it matter if you skip a meal or not, the impact of foods on other diseases like brain health and immunity when we're facing COVID-19, allergies, cancer, there's so much more to learn, but we know enough to focus on these foods in our, in our policy priorities. So how do we get there? Well, we've done a lot of work on this, both on the research side at Tufts, working with collaborators from around, around the country, and also on the advocacy side, going to Congress, going to state leaders and telling them about these policies, trying to inform them and tell them about the best, the best science. So I think there's six categories of interventions. There's no single silver bullet. We have to, we have to address food and reimagine food policy across all of these areas, science and innovation, healthcare, economic incentives, our schools, our work sites, and standards and labeling. And I'm, I'm not gonna you know, walk you through every bullet on this slide, 
But all of this is available. I can share this. It's available online on our website, foodprice.org. But I'll go through some of the key uh, examples here. Um, so first, we need to reimagine our food policy so that we address food uh, as medicine. And when I say food as medicine, it means the idea, the concept that food is foundational to prevent and treat disease. And so there's a range of policies that are actually being tested and implemented around the country now that show that this is the case. And these range from things at the top of the food as medicine pyramid, like medically tailored meals, which are for the sickest, uh, uh, sickest patients in our, in our healthcare system, then produce prescription pack packages, which I'll talk about, uh, produce prescription programs, which are people that, that have a diet related disease like hypertension or obesity or diabetes and need to get you know, healthier produce down to you know, major nutrition assistance programs, which are sort of the foundation for prevention for everyone in the population. All of these things are important and all of these things should be considered uh, as food uh, as medicine. So what are medically tailored meals? This is a really exciting innovation just in the last uh, 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 10 years or so. A lot of excellent science has shown that the sickest people in our country, about 5% of the population uses about 50% of all of our healthcare system uh, resources because they are, they are very, very ill. They have end-stage renal disease, they have cancer, they have heart failure, they have poorly controlled type two diabetes, they have uh, HIV. Uh, these diseases are, are devastating and cause enormous sickness. And, and as a cardiologist, I'm, I'm, I'm a cardiologist, when I see patients and they come in with one of these conditions, I know I'm gonna see them again in three months or six months in the emergency room or, or in the hospital. These uh, uh, patients go home and they come in malnourished and they leave the hospital malnourished and they go home and they're not able to prepare and cook healthy meals for themselves. Many, many studies have shown if you actually give healthy meals to these people at home, you deliver meals at home to, to these patients once they're discharged from the hospital, they do much better. Hospitalizations go down, emergency room visits go down, nursing home admissions go down, and costs go down. And so one analysis in Massachusetts showed that giving these chronically ill food insecure patients, nutritionally tailored meals reduces hospital admissions by 50%, reduces nursing home admissions by 70%. And actually, even if you account for the cost of the food in the program, it saves money. It saves $9,000 per year per patient. So this is a, a no brainer. This is absolutely essential that we implement medically tailored meals throughout our healthcare system and particularly uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Now, the next example I wanna discuss is produce prescriptions. Produce prescriptions, as I mentioned, is for people who aren't quite as sick. They have diseases like diabetes or hypertension, they're food insecure, uh, but they're, not, they're still able to go and get food and, sh and, and cook and shop. And so for this these larger numbers of patients, there have been several studies, 26 published studies, which have looked at the impact of produce prescriptions on, on uh, uh, such patients. And the prescriptions can be, yeah, given in different ways. People can get a voucher that they can go use. They can get a, actually a subsidized food box uh, in the hospital or in the clinic. They can get a cash back rebate from an electronic card if they, if they go shop uh, at, at grocery stores. There's different ways to do this. Now, most of these studies have been brief, only up to a, you know, a few months, but all, a few have gone out to six or 12 months. And while these studies aren't perfect and, and more science is needed, if you put all the evidence together, 21 of 22 studies that looked at diet quality found increased fruit and vegetable intake and or other increased measures of diet quality. So the programs clearly improve nutritional quality. Three of four that looked at diabetic patients found reductions in hemoglobin A1C, which is the measure of you know, diabetic control. And two of five that looked at, at weight found either decreased weight or, or a BMI. So there's lots of evidence that produce prescriptions are incredibly promising and should be expanded and tested uh, in healthcare. Uh, and we've done an analysis looking at the cost effectiveness of what if you gave produce prescriptions to every single person, every single adult in Medicare and Medicaid? What if every single adult could go to their doctor and if they wanted it, get a card or get a voucher for 30% off uh, fresh uh, uh, or canned or frozen uh, fruits and vegetables? And I won't go into all the numbers on this graph. These are cost effectiveness curves. Um, but I'll just highlight that, that any intervention is cost effectiveness if it costs less than $150,000 per quality adjusted life you're saved. And so at any time point, this intervention is cost effective. But what I think was most telling about this analysis is what we estimated was that this intervention, giving produce prescription programs, is about as cost effective uh, as giving statin drugs, cholesterol lowering drugs for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. 
And that's a best buy. That's a best buy in healthcare. And so if we're giving cholesterol lowering drugs in healthcare and paying for it, which of course we are and should be, we should be paying for fresh produce in healthcare as well. And then lastly, the third thing I want to cover in the healthcare system is medical education. We need to have our doctors, our other allied uh, uh, health professionals really understand nutrition and understand how to advise their patients on nutrition, how to refer them on nutrition. And many studies in the last 10 years have shown that over 80, 90% of doctors, whether they're in training or out of training, want to know more about nutrition. They're asking for this training. Why can't they get this training? Well, it's because the tests, all of the tests that doctors have to take are, are packed with, with other questions about genetics and fancy tests and surgeries and other things. There aren't questions on nutrition. And so there's lots of ways to, to address this, but the simplest thing to do is to change the tests, to incorporate nutrition into all the tests that are done for physicians at every stage of their training, and also to change the accreditation standards. We have accreditation bodies that, that accredit medical schools and residency programs and other training for healthcare professionals. If we just change the accreditation programs and change the tests, medical schools will change overnight, physicians will get the training that they want, and patients will get uh, the benefits. Now, I talk about these things, and for folks who aren't, um, haven't been following this, you might say, all oh, this sounds great, but this is just pie in the sky. This is too idealistic. This is never going to happen. I want to share that it's actually starting to happen. So this is, as I said, a special moment in time to advance and accelerate this. And so these are just a few examples. Um, in 2016, uh, John Hancock, <clears throat> which is here in Boston, one of the country's leading life insurance organizations, introduced a program called Vitality, which actually rewards their clients for buying healthy food, pays them for buying healthy food because, because they live longer and John Hancock actually makes money. Everybody wins. The Farm Bill in 2018 included uh, uh, $25 million uh, to test, uh, excuse me, that should be uh, $50 million per year to test produce prescriptions in healthcare. And so some of the recent COVID relief bills have temporarily expanded that amount to test uh, produce prescriptions. Uh, the state of California uh, is spending money to test medically tailored meals. Kaiser Permanente, the biggest HMO in the country, is testing these interventions. The state of Massachusetts has put in $150 million through a Medicaid waiver program to test food and housing programs in healthcare. And in the House, uh, uh, Chairman McGovern, Chairman of the Rules Committee last year, introduced a bill, the Medically Tailored Me uh, Home Delivered Meals Demonstration Pilot Act, which I believe and I hope he will reintroduce this year, to direct Medicare to test medically tailored meals. And we're working uh, with a coalition to try to encourage Congress to, to create a similar bill for produce prescription programs. So that's a lot on healthcare. And I just want to switch now and talk a little bit about some of our nutrition programs in our country. Um, I think that one important take home message I would like to talk about is we need to switch from talking about food security to nutrition security. We've been talking about food security and food insecurity for the last 25 years, and it's been very important and very powerful to address problems of food access and affordability. But food quality, nutrition, has been underemphasized. Food security technically includes nutrition, but, but that's really been missing from the programs and the metrics uh, uh, to address food security. And so we need to shift to start talking about nutrition and security because that addresses food access, affordability, and nutrition. And I'm really uh, delighted by uh, Secretary uh, Tom Vilsack, our new USA Secretary, who has, is talking a lot about nutrition security. In a Senate confirmation hearing on February 3rd, he said, our nation suffers from nutrition security. We must do more to ensure access to the nutritious foods that can protect and promote health. So not just access to food, but access to quality food. And so we have a, uh, an, uh, uh, an op-ed coming out uh, penned by myself and Sheila Fleischacker and Chef Jose Andres, uh, which talks about this. And I think it's very important that we, as a nation, start talking about nutrition insecurity as the next natural evolution to, to promote equitable well-being for all Americans. Um, and so one example is SNAP. This is the major feeding program in the United States, the major nutrition program in the United States, and we have to use it to better leverage uh, the program for nutrition, not just food access. There's many options that have been discussed, and so I just wanna share with you some of our findings from these three options. One is to give everybody a fruit and vegetable incentive, a 30% subsidy. This is happening now through the GustNet program, but the GustNet program is, is very underfunded. Uh, in the Farm Bill, 
there was about a dollar per person per year on SNAP uh, uh, available to give fruit and vegetable incentives. So not nearly enough to provide fruit and vegetable incentives to everybody. So we, we asked the question, what if we provided a 30% subsidy for fruit and vegetable incentives to everybody on the SNAP program? What would it do to health and what would it cost? Then we said, okay, well, what if we paired that with restriction of, of, of soda, with restriction of sugar, sweetened beverages? This is something that has been proposed. Uh, and, you know, there are very thorny and very real ethical and moral questions around restricting choices for people uh, who are on, on SNAP. And so this is, this is not necessarily a straightforward question whether restricting uh, soda is a good or a bad idea. But we said, what would happen if you added soda restriction to the fruit and vegetable incentive? And then lastly, we asked the question, what if you subsidize much more than fruit and vegetables? What if you give a 30% subsidy on a range of healthy foods, not just fruits and vegetables, but also beans and legumes and fish and seafood and healthy plant oils uh, and other foods? And what if instead of restricting choice, you let people, as, as I think we should, you know, choose the foods they want, but you had a disincentive. So if they bought, let's say, processed meats or junk foods or soda, there would be a 30% disincentive. And people know that up front. They know up front that if they get the healthier food, they get a little bit more for their dollar. And if they get their unhealthy food, they get a little bit less. What did we find? Well, we found that the fruit and vegetable incentive would save 300,000 cardiovascular events over a lifetime of people on currently on SNAP. Uh, and if you added soda restriction, the health benefits would significantly increase 800,000 lifetime events uh, prevented. But if you did what we call SNAP plus an incentive disincentive program together, you would prevent the most cardiovascular events while preserving choice of participants for, for food. In terms of cost of the programs, I, again, some of these numbers, you know, may be a little bit wonky, but we found that at five years, the fruit and vegetable incentive is very, very expensive, but by a lifetime, it becomes cost effective. Uh, if you add soda restriction, it becomes cost effective much earlier because you know you get additional health benefits, but again, this has this thorny issue of restricting choice. And then the SNAP Plus program, um, it was not only cost effective, it actually saved money. It saved $10 billion for the, for the government in SNAP costs and healthcare costs in five years, and it saved $63 billion over a lifetime. And so I believe that SNAP Plus should be piloted and tested, and, and, and if it works, scaled up and implemented you know, in, in many states across the country. Now, what about uh, people who are buying their food from other sources, grocery stores, restaurants, and schools. I, you know, I, I, I want to focus on schools, but first I want to show you uh, how I think about nutrition security based on the food source. And these are papers that, this is a paper that um, uh, is not yet uh, uh, published, but has been accepted. And so what this chart shows you is among, among adults and among children, the uh, proportion of, of uh, meals that are of poor nutritional quality, intermediate nutritional quality, or, or high nutritional quality stratified by income. And so blue is the proportion of, of meals that are of intermediate diet quality. Uh, red is the proportion of meals that are of poor diet quality. And green, very low, is the proportion of meals that are of ideal quality. And these are years, you can't see the years, it goes from about 2000 to 2016. And so what did we find? We found that you know over time, over time, if you look at high income uh, adults, that the proportion of meals they're getting from grocery stores that are of intermediate diet quality are going up, and the proportion of meals that are of poor diet quality are going down, and the proportion that are of ideal diet quality are also going up, although, although slowly. So on average, high-income Americans are improving their diets over the last 20 years. But if you look at lower-income adults, the differences are smaller. And so there's, there were inequities to start, and the inequities are getting worse. And if you look at children, you see the same pattern, high or even worse. High income children, their diet quality of food purchased from grocery stores in the United States is going up. More, more uh, diets with better quality and fewer diets with poor quality, but almost no improvement in lower income uh, uh, children. If we look at restaurants, uh, restaurants to, to uh, compare, you see a very, very similar pattern. Although poor diet quality diets are even higher here, you see improvements in, in better quality diets and reductions in worse quality diets among the highest income Americans, very little change among low income Americans. And so there were disparities to start 20 years ago and the disparities are getting worse. And you see the exact same pattern in children. There were disparities to start and the disparities are getting worse by income over the last 20 years. The reason I showed you grocery stores and restaurants where, where basically there's poor diet quality 
and there's disparities that are persistent or getting worse, is I wanted to show you schools and what's happened in schools. And so this slide shows you schools and you'll notice the graphs look different. And so I wanna walk you through the graphs. And this shows you um, children age five to 19 by income and by race and what's happened over the same period by income and by race. And so what you see is that diets were kind of going along fairly flat, not much change. And then right here around 2010, a dramatic improvement in diet quality among every income group a dramatic improvement in diet quality around 2010 in every racial group with increases in good diet quality, intermediate diet quality, excuse me, and reductions in poor diet quality. So why is this so different? Why is this graph so different? What we see is flat, nothing changing, and then big improvements after 2010. And we see that these improvements are equitable by income and equitable by race. What, what happened in 2010? The Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. And so the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which was so instrumental, uh, to our to to improving childhood nutrition, this shows you the power of a single policy, a single policy change for improving nutrition equitably for millions of Americans. And people actually criticize schools and school meals a lot. But after 2010, if you actually put all of this together, schools are now the single healthiest place on average to get meals in the United States. And so, whether you're an adult or a child, the school meal is actually healthier than the average food purchased in grocery stores or restaurants or work sites or food trucks or entertainment venues or anywhere else in our country. Schools are actually the healthiest place to eat. So um, what do we need to do beyond the nutrition feeding programs and healthcare? Those are the two topics I discussed and I just wanna close in the last few minutes to talk about science. Uh, we really need to push science and innovation, and this is the third and last area I, I'm, I'm going to cover. There are so many opportunities for more science and things we can do if we had more science around public guidance, precision nutrition, health equity, implementation science, agriculture and sustainability, monitoring surveillance, reduced healthcare spending, many, many, many benefits. And we, we reviewed all this in a paper which Senator Harkin is a co-author on this paper, which we published last year. I'm happy to share this with you. At the pace we're going, we're gonna figure out all of this stuff, but we're, it's gonna take us 50 or 75 years to figure out all this stuff. We don't have 50 or 75 years as, as I've showed you. So we really need a national moonshot around nutrition science and we need to push forward innovation. Um, uh, overall investment in nutrition research has been flat at NIH and USDA. This shows you the proportion of the overall budget uh, in blue and the proportion dedicated to nutrition science in dark blue. You can see while we face this incredible pandemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes and inequities in, in nutrition, there's been not really increased investment in nutrition science. There's also nutrition science beyond NIH and USDA. And so in our, in our review, we found that almost every agency, including the Department of Defense, including NASA, including uh, the National Science Foundation, including the VA, including USAID, all these agencies care about nutrition science and yet it's fragmented. And we also found that over the last 50 years, there's, this has been noticed before. And so, you know, I'm not gonna go into detail of the chart here, it's in the paper, but basically about every five or 10 years, there was a major report saying that food and nutrition is, is fundamental to our country uh, and that we need to do something to organize and strengthen and coordinate federal nutrition research. And yet nothing really has been done in the last 50 years that has been as effective as envisioned, although there were some good things that, that happened along the way. And so in our paper, we looked at all this and we came up with three big categories of recommendations. You know, first we need cross-governmental coordination. We spend more on food and nutrition uh, programming in the United States than we spend on national intelligence. And yet we have an office of the director of national intelligence which coordinates our national intelligence, but we don't have um, any office coordinating our national food and nutrition policy. So our top recommendation was to have an office of the National Director of Food and Nutrition, which coordinates uh, nutrition policy. And then we had several recommendations to strengthen research within NIH and within USDA. And our top recommendation is to create a new National Institute of Nutrition within NIH. Um, th so those are, I think, two top recommendations I'm gonna share. And very, very briefly, and we can get into this in the questions, You know, the, the Office of the National Director of Food and Nutrition, which we propose, is built on the very successful model of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, which was created in 2003, 2004, after September 11th, when we realized we had fragmented, unharmonized intelligence efforts. Well, we have fragmented, unharmonized food and nutrition policy efforts, and we need to coordinate those. And then secondly, the National Institute of Nutrition, 
The NIH has 27 centers and institutes. They're amazing. They're doing wonderful work. They don't have an institute dedicated to nutrition, which is the, the number one cause of poor health. And so we need a new institute with new funding, not to take away any funding or any nutrition research already going on. We need a new uh, institute with new funding to really take on these nutrition uh, issues. There's huge return on investment for this. I won't go into it in terms of uh, too much detail because of time, but this return of dollars to the economy, it lets us leverage our nutrition assistance programs and our US aid programs. It'll reduce healthcare spending. It'll catalyze and unlock private business growth. It'll advance the economic vibrancy of US farms and rural communities, and it'll improve our resilience against acute threats that are gonna come like COVID-19. Um, there's over 80 businesses and advocacy groups in support of these efforts, and this is a list of them. And again, you can go to our website to see this. The Harkin Institute is one of these supportive organizations, and we're working with this coalition to identify key actions to move this forward. This is a very, very impressive group. Groups like the Amer American Diabetes Association, the NAACP, major food companies, insurance companies, uh, 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 retail retailers. This is this is this is a, a, a uh, an idea for, for which the time has come. Uh, and so um, uh, there's also work to do with innovating business and moving forward in business. I won't go into too much detail on that, but I think the private sector actually understands this now and the private sector is starting to pour lots of capital into creating food companies that improve nutrition and equity and sustainability. We're working on this. We have a new innovation institute, the Tufts Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute, which is working with businesses and nonprofits to create a healthier, more equitable, and more sustainable uh, food system. And so I wanna close uh, and say, it's really time for a reimagined food system. We need a new national consensus and strategy on food and nutrition. And uh, we, we penned an op-ed just about a week ago uh, with Secretary uh, Dan Glickman, Secretary Donna Shalala, and Secretary Ann Veneman saying that, you know, it's been 52 years, it's time for the second White House conference on food, nutrition, and health to bring all these ideas to the table and come up with real solutions and have the White House and, and Congress uh, implement uh, the, the best ones. We need a reinvigorated national health and science infrastructure. We need to implement food as medicine for better health and lower healthcare spending. We need to address nutrition security in our nutrition feeding programs for the COVID-19 recovery and beyond. I didn't talk about this, but we need to address sustainable nutrition, jobs and climate. And again, I skipped this for time. We need to really focus on business innovation and jobs that increase consumer choice, nutrition, equity, and sustainability. So thank you so much for the time. I apologize for the uh, initial glitch with the audio, and I really look forward to further discussion. Thank you, Dr. Mozafarian, for an educational and powerful presentation. We're excited to spend the next half hour hearing more from Dr. Mozafarian. You can submit your questions in the chat box. The Q&A will be moderated by our Associate Director of Wellness and Nutrition Policy, Lindy buckingham Shutt. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lindy buckingham Shutt. I'm the Associate Director of Wellness and Nutrition Policy at the Harkin Institute. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mozaparian, for your excellent and educational presentation. Um, I have a question to start here with you while we have some chat questions coming in. So you, you spoke about this, you really understand the importance of really looking at the history and the past to make progress for the present and the future. However, not everyone understands the importance of exploring our past in order to understand the present and where, where we should go. Um, so what are some strategies you use to educate others, especially decision makers, on the importance of looking at the bigger picture, including how we can focus more on prevention? Well, in my, I'm not an expert at this, um, but but in my conversations, you know, many visits to the Hill and, and conversations uh, with folks in Congress in particular, um, both the, the le elected leaders themselves and their staff, their, you know, appreciation and understanding of these issues is like the average educated consumer. They they don't know anything more or less about nutrition than, than, than anyone who's just reading the newspapers and going to the grocery store and shopping, and they all care about these issues. And so, I think the first thing is that um, it, it's actually it's actually not that complicated if you kind of put it all together, but nobody's put it all together and shared it with them before. Um, people come to them and talk about you know the economy and jobs. People come to them and talk about um, climate. People come to them and talk about equity, but not that many people have come and talked to them about nutrition. And so we believe that um, at at uh, Tufts, as you do at Drake, that academic institutions have a special role to play 
because we have the cutting edge science. We're credible. We're trusted. Um, we're um, you know don't have a, a any any horse horse in the race. We just want to improve our, our, our population's health and, and our country. And so I think academic institutions have been on the sidelines too much. And and we need institutes like yours and efforts like we're doing our public impact initiative so that we actually take the information to the, the policymakers. Then you need funding to do that, um, you know, because our, our institution, Drake University, is supported by tuition and research dollars, and tuition and research dollars don't pay for this. And so we need foundations, we need uh, wealthy individuals to care about these issues and come forward and support academic institutions so that, you know, we're not just publishing papers and doing science and hoping somebody reads them, but we're able to produce polished briefs, we're able to produce, you know, two-page, three-pagers, summing these things up, videos, short things, have visits to, to congressional leaders. We basically haven't had any organized system of getting the science to the policymakers. And so I'm cautiously optimistic that if we can do that, um, we will advance, you know, their knowledge and policy change. Great, thank you. And I feel like that fits really well into what you're talking about, the call for the National Institute of Nutrition. Um, so, I mean, can, can you elaborate, you know, on why it's important to create the National Institute of Nutrition and how you specifically are working with government leaders to push that effort forward? Yeah, so, you know, we propose several options to strengthen research within nutrition research within NIH specifically. We also, also USDA, but we'll talk about NIH. And the National Institute of Nutrition wasn't the only option. So there were other ones that, that we described. And for example, one of them was to move the Office of Nutrition Research, which was a very tiny underfunded office uh, buried away in, in, in one of the institutes into the NIH Office of the Director. And so in preparing our recommendations, we worked hard to brief the NIH USDA agencies on what we were doing, why we were doing it, ask for their input and feedback. And so we, we tried as best as we can to be inclusive because this isn't any criticism of NIH, right? NIH is, a, is remarkable. It's the world's leader in research. This isn't a criticism. This is trying to work with them collaboratively to identify solutions. And I mentioned the Office of Nutrition Research. What we recommended that office get moved into the office of the director, which is the top office for leadership and coordination. And our paper came out in July. We briefed NIH on this. And in December of last year, they announced they were moving the Office of Nutrition Research into the office of the director. And on January 1st, they did that. And that's a big positive move. And so I just want to sh share that first that you know, we're trying as best we can to be inclusive and include NIH uh, in, in, and, hear, and, and hear what's important to, to them as we're making our recommendations. So that's something they can do without legislation. They can't create a new institute without legislation, right? That a new institute needs to be created by legislation and it needs funding. And actually the last uh, uh, senator to create new institutes at NIH was Senator Tom Harkin. So it's been a while since new institutes have been created. So I think it's really crucial that um, you know a National Institute of Nutrition be created because you need structure and authority. When we looked back at, at the 50 years of, of recommendations about what we should do about this stuff, um, committees were formed and you know hearings were had, but there wasn't structure and authority created to address this. And what we've realized is without structure and authority, you know, you you things can not not move forward very fast or with a new administration things your know, priorities can change and and and, and um, you don't get progress and so the reason a national institute of nutrition is so important is it creates a leader an institute leader it creates a focal point for nutrition research at nih with new additional funding and that that institute can not only perform cutting edge research it can coordinate nutrition research across all of the other institutes it can coordinate nutrition research with the DOD and the, and the Veterans Affairs and the USDA and, and many others. It can put out guidelines for nutrition for people with disease conditions. Um, the NIH and USDA many years ago decided that they're gonna split up nutrition. The USDA is gonna focus on nutrition guidance for healthy Americans and the NIH is gonna focus on nutrition for diseased Americans. So the dietary guidelines for Americans, which come out of mostly uh, USDA's process, or for healthy Americans. And as I showed you, a minority of Americans are actually healthy. So the dietary guidelines are not intended to, to be for people with diabetes or obesity or hypertension or cancer or what do you think? So NIH could do dietary guidelines. They could help with training and training of healthcare professionals in medical schools and many other things. So, so you know, it, it's a long answer to, but there's even more to talk about because there's a lot of benefits. And, and it, this is highlighted in our white paper, uh, which I'm, I'm happy to, to share to interested listeners. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and we're working on getting Senator Harkin on the call, uh, and he can maybe speak a little bit more to the importance of the creation of, of you know, um, institutes within the 
um, within NIH, and and so hopefully we'll we'll get to that. Um, but another question that that we have is, you've already mentioned that you know one of Tufts' initiatives right now is the Food as Medicine Initiative, and it's it's trying to raise awareness of the impact um, of food on national well-being, share the advances in both science and technology that inform priorities, and provide trusted signs on actionable actionable and impactful solutions. Um, so who is instrumental in moving this initiative forward? And then what are some groups or people that have yet to join the efforts um, that you think are important to be a part of this? Yeah, th thank you. And the question was on the Food is Medicine initiative, right? Yep, that is correct. Yeah. Yeah, so so um, so I think that um, you know when our, our school was founded by Dr. Jean Mayer, who led and organized that White House conference, and so when that that conference and his work made him the the you know, nationally renowned, he became president of Tufts. And the first thing he did was create our, our school because he, want, he he recognized from his work that nutrition was not just about biochemistry and bench science, but also about policy, economics, disparities, agriculture. Uh, behavior change, community interventions. And so he wanted to create a school that had in its DNA this multidisciplinary translational approach to, to, to nutrition and policy change. And so when I came to Tufts six years ago, one of the first things that we did is, is we said, let's do a new strategic plan for the next five years. And in that strategic plan, one of our eight top themes that came out was public impact, that we needed to continue in the DNA of our school this effort on public impact. And so the Food and Medicine Initiative uh, and the Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute, which is focused on business innovation, those two initiatives came out of the public uh, impact initiative, which is that we want to be much more active about taking our science to policymakers. Now, I think we've had some great successes and we've, we've had a lot of positive achievements um, yeah, in conversations, but it hasn't been easy and it hasn't been well funded. And so, um, you know, we've had a lot of trouble actually getting traditional organizations that fund universities to fund policy and advocacy efforts. They they think it's a good idea, but they are uncomfortable with it. Because again, in universities, you typically educate students and do research. And they say, why should you be going and giving your information to policymakers? We have had some success. And so the Rockefeller Foundation in particular, I, my, my hat's off to uh, uh, Rod Shaw and Roy Steiner and, and others at the Rockefeller Foundation who are uh, uh, supporting uh, this, this, this work. Um, I think that it's um, they are one foundation who has supported uh, some of this policy and advocacy. But I, but so we're we're on the way. But I, I don't think we're going as fast as we can because of lack of resources. Yeah, yeah I think the lack of resources is um, obviously something that we know too as being a policy institute. It's very hard sometimes to find that. But um, we're, I feel like we're getting fortunate that more foundations are seeing this larger system approach to a lot of this work and, and understanding the policy is an important piece of that. Um, so thank you for saying that. Okay, um, we have a question. Um, well, there is much to be done at the national level. What are your suggestions for what state legislatures and state agencies can do to improve nutrition outcomes? Um, please address what states can do to improve upon federal nutrition programs, but also what can be done outside of federal nutrition programs. Yeah. So states and municipalities are, you know, essential crucibles for innovation. And so a lot of innovations can come out of cities and states and then go to the national level. Um, personally, I've had worked less, although many of our faculty have worked more at those levels. Personally, I've worked more at the federal level because as I showed you with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, one small change at the federal level can have huge effects. And so I think that's to me, you know, where I, I have paid my focus. But that being said, there is definitely room for innovation at the state level. And I think the, the top things that states can, can do and, and think about are uh, Medicaid. And so half of Medicaid dollars are, are implemented by the states and they can apply for waivers and do things um, to test food as medicine and other interventions. And then the second top thing is SNAP uh, because again, they can ask for pilots to test SNAP. And so I think those are two really important things they can do. I think you know states can also do things around taxation. Uh, and so um, there hasn't been a state soda tax passed, but there's been many county and city taxes passed. And I think King County, where Seattle, Washington is, is a really good example of a local effort because they passed a soda tax, which raised billions of dollars uh, uh, in revenue, or, or maybe I'm getting the number wrong, at least hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, I think billions. And, um, and they're using all of that money to 
improve subsidies for healthy eating for low income residents of King County. And so they're not taking that money and turning it back around to build bridges or to you know, shore up the budget. They're using the, 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 the taxation revenue for those purposes. So I think taxes are also, it, we're pretty unlikely to see a federal tax on unhealthy food, but I think states could, could uh, do a, a tax. So I think those are three areas that, that states I think can be really, uh, really valuable and important in policy. Yeah, and you addressed this during your presentation, uh, but... Uh, Darius, this is, this is Tom Harkin. Can, can you hear me now? We can, hear, on? we can hear you, Tom. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, Darius, I lost video, so I, at least I have audio. I just heard the last question and your answer uh, about uh, state and, and local communities. Uh, back when we had earmarks, I had started a program of earmarking uh, money to local communities in Iowa to come up with innovative approaches on, on uh, uh, promoting wellness. Uh, and um, interesting things were done with some of these grants, like uh, uh, one community built a, a whole walking path around a retirement home, and they had it set up in a way that encouraged people to get out and walk a half a mile or a quarter mile or a mile every day. Another community used the money to, uh, uh, they bought a, a van uh, in the middle of the winter and, and they went and picked up elderly people to come to the mall to do mall walking. And then they would stop at a healthy uh, juice bar at the mall and, and get elderly people to have a more uh, a, a healthful morning diet. Another community used the money to establish with a local grocery store big uh, arrows that would point to different places in the store where there was healthy food. For example, if you went to the aisle where there was cookies and potato chips and stuff, there were no arrows. But if you went to the aisle with, uh, say, fruits and vegetables or uh, grains, there would be a lot of arrows pointing to the healthy food. Very innovative kind of things. Now, what that led me to do was to include in the Affordable Care Act uh, what we called community improvement grants. And these were grants based upon what I'd done to go to communities to get them to think about what they could do on their own to improve wellness and nutrition. Well, <laughs> we started with the community progress, but then the Congress defunded it, just totally took it out of the program, and we have not had it since. But I think with a little bit of money like that, a little bit of seed money, to get communities together to think on their own about what they can do, you get some pretty innovative, and then you, and then you get people at the local area to buy into it. And then it becomes kind of self-sustaining after that. So I just wanted to say that in hopes that perhaps we can rejuvenate these community improvement grants so that local uh, cities, communities, and others can start thinking about sort of the things that you also talked about, what they can do on their own. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, um, Senator Harkin, and um, y y there's a lot of innovation and power in local communities. I think, I think that has to be matched with federal action because our food system is, is not only regional, not only national, it's global. And so they're always going to be swimming upstream um, until uh, these, these national policies also are supported. But I think the combination of, of creative funded communities to, to do these innovations and, and, and buy in with national policy is, is, the, is the right solution. I agree. That, that's an excellent point. And I think both of you did a good job, Dr. Mosfar and you did a good job talking about how policy is really important um, at the local level. And then Senator Harkin did a good job talking about environmental changes, whether that's the physical or built environment, how we really need to focus on kind of a more collective way of changing things. It's not, it's not just going to happen through policy um, or, or changing our environment. OK, we have about five minutes, so I have one more question for the two of you. Um, is it enough to assume that elected officials reflect the values of their constituents, or do we need to be more deliberate in efforts to create public debate over the ethical issues? I'm, I'm sorry, Lindy, this is Tom. I'm sorry, uh, Darius's voice is very clear to me, but yours is kind of muffled. So say that question again very slowly. Of course. 
Is it enough to assume that elected officials reflect the values of their constituents, or do we need to be more deliberate in efforts to create public debate over the ethical issues? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Darius, maybe you, under, I don't understand that question. I, I can, I can repeat it. The, que the, the question is, can we assume that elected officials are informed and ethical, essentially, or do we need to have public debates to ensure that, that the, the issues of ethics and decision making are brought to the fore in, in how elected officials make decisions? Well, I, I, either you can answer that or I can, of course, we need a public debate on that. and. And as, as Darius, as you and I both know, and I think a lot of people know that elected officials are pulled in a lot of different directions. There's a lot of lobbyists out there, a, very, a lot of powerful food interest uh, promoting unhealthy food. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so, uh, yes, uh, we need more public discourse. I don't know if debate is the right word, but we, 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 do, we need more public discourse. Uh, nationally uh, on on these policies that we're, we're trying to try, trying to espouse because every time when I was in office and I would have town meetings and community meetings on this issue people want better food they want healthy food but they feel trapped they can't find it they can't afford it it's not available and there's all kinds of confusing things about whole grains and this and that, and they don't know sort of who to believe. Uh, and so in that kind of a milieu, uh, the voices of special interests uh, in promoting unhealthy food and cheap uh, uh, food uh, become prevalent. So the short, that's a long answer. The short answer, yes, we need much more public discourse on this topic. Yeah, I, and, I, and I started my, my talk, I agree that, that I think there actually is a special moment in time this year around food. The, the, the combination of Black Lives Matter, COVID-19 has really raised issues around nutrition security uh, and, um, and uh, fragmented supply chains, lost jobs. Most of the lost jobs are, are in the food sector. Uh, and what I what I want to and, and you can see that the Biden administration has already acted and the Senate's already acted to address some of that uh, in, in expansion, temporary expansion of some nutrition security policies. Um, but what I don't yet see is that the intersections with chronic diseases, diabetes and obesity and other diseases, which are also devastating and causing huge inequities, have not been fully linked and brought in. The links to sustainability and climate and national security haven't been brought in. And the links to innovation, innovation in, in the private sector, science, innovation have not yet been brought in. And the links to healthcare and healthcare system and food as medicine have not yet been brought in. So if we can take that special moment in time where food is really recognized to be foundational and foundational for, 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 for people's health and add those dimensions to the conversation through public discourse, um, I think we, you know, we may be able to, again, like we did 50 years ago, step back and actually create some really imaginative and new and effective policies for the next 50 years. Great. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Dr. Mozavarian, for a wonderful presentation and joining us today. And thank you, Senator Harkin, for joining us over the phone. It was great to have you, you two um, leaders both here to talk. A, a pleasure. I, I, I was, I'm, I'm honored to be, uh, be involved. Yeah.